Hi folks, so um, this is my first actual YouTube video, so um, excuse small mistakes I do, or if something isn't quite right. Okay, so the topic for today is how to start in digital painting, and that's a very scary topic, so I want to tackle it right on. Okay, first of all we have to clarify what I mean by painting. Yeah, this word isn't as cut clean as you might think. I define painting as a piece with no lines, at least no drawn lines, with smooth shading, at least most of the time, um, and overall just um, portraying a subject with 3D space in mind. So that spheres are shaded like spheres, and not cell shaded, for example. So these things you see in the background right now, those are all considered paintings by my definition. Now you might say, all 3D space? With all the different lighting and all the different color? Oh shoot! And to that I have to say yes. Unfortunately, yes. I mean, over time you can decide how much of this um, 3D space information you want to put in your piece, but it would be good to consider it in the first place. But that's where the first point on my list kicks in. Basically, don't overwhelm yourself. I know it's quite scary for beginner painters when they see all of these gorgeous paintings online and are just whoa okay but but why why do they have shadows here and, and why is there light and how how do they do that i know that i was at that point too but at the beginning just take it simple you don't have to create these huge complex pieces right off the bat no one I mean, no one would give a kid in elementary school college paper to read. Like, that's not how it goes. So we are starting small. And we are starting with reference. For painting, at least in the early stages, reference is more important than anything else. Take good reference photos and use simple objects for the start. Like, we are moving slowly in. With these clean objects, we'll have a much better time understanding the fundamentals. Um, here I got some bullet points about how our first objects should be. First of all, simple shapes. That's easy enough. We want to have clear shapes. For example, the snail shell. It's made of a bunch of spheres. It's as easy as that. Or the toilet paper. It's just made of a cylinder with a sheet on it. Um, then we want to reduce patterns. And that's where the snail is pretty crabby. Because it has a lot of color, it has a lot of pattern on it. And that makes it way harder to see where the actual shadows are. So we want to avoid that. Then of course, next point, clear shadows. If we have a really complex object, we might get confused with shadows and that mixes with the next point, which is as little glass and shiny objects as possible because those are so confusing and we don't need that extra hurdle uh, when we're just starting out. So these objects on the top are all pretty simple. At least if you compare them to something like a human face or a full-on fantasy illustration. Uh, and we are starting out with those. For the next point I want to talk to you about the wrong kind of reference. Wrong in air quotes here. Um, because it's not wrong in the sense that it's forbidden or something. But it either does not help you or... It's just straight up scamming yourself, basically. 
Um, as an example, I picked the snail shell from earlier. And let's just look at the options. The first option we have is, of course, don't use the reference. You think you know what a snail looks like, so you draw the snail. Um, yeah, th that's not really what we want to do. I mean, we get reference shots, and if you've never drawn or analyzed a photo of a snail, how would you know what a snail looks like? It's like I uh, asked you to, I don't know, draw a deer skull out of your head and you've never even seen a deer. Doesn't make any sense, so we are just using reference place. At least in the early stages. We can stray away from it later, especially with stylization and stuff, but for the early stages, please use the reference. The second thing people do, they have a reference, they look at it, and they draw it. The problem with this, they did not observe in most cases. As you can see here, um, the color is all right, there's a bit of pattern on there, the shapes, fine. But the shadows, the shadows are off because the light is coming from slightly below the snail even. So there shouldn't be a shadow on the underside of that snail. And they, they copied the image but didn't pay attention to how the form is, where the light is coming from. They just copied the form and the color and put in the rest with guesses. And we do not want to guess. Especially in recent times, I've seen the third thing here quite often. Either tracing or color picking or even both. Yeah, it, it gives you decent outcomes. I mean, the snail looks like a snail and it looks painterly and it looks colorful and it looks like the shadows are hit. But you won't learn anything that way. You trace the snail, or in this case I trace the snail, and I pick the colors and put them at the exact same spot as in the reference image. So. I did not learn anything about the form because I didn't think about the form. I just grabbed the color and put it on the same place. Also you ain't creating anything new. I mean, what does it bring you if you can copy a photo perfectly? Like you could have just taken the photo and go with that. Let's work for you. But you're just betraying yourself. It's not really that bad. I see a lot of people pointing it out. Which, yeah, I get why they feel betrayed. Because they probably worked really hard for years. And even after years, you can't recreate colors like on photos. That's just not happening in the first few years. So these people who probably spent like three, four ye or four years on training their skills just see someone tracing and then um, putting colors in it and it doesn't feel right enough about that because this is the way i'd recommend um you analyzing an image like that first of all of course sketch here you want to get the shape of the object right, you want to get the outline and any important lines you might see on it. Then the second stage, I think the most important stage of it all. You have to identify the shadows. Where is the light coming from? Where are the shadows on the photo? And that's where the snail isn't that great because it's textured, you can't really see all the shadows because it's overall pretty splashed on with colors. But if you can identify the shadows, please put them down first. After that, you can paint the rest. That's no problem. You can paint and put highlights, 
as soon as your shadows are in place, you, you can't really do anything wrong. And on this whole process, I want you to analyze the form. Go in your head and think about, okay, why is the light hitting only on the one side and not on the other? Why are the shadows where they are? And I've put this in last place here, but you really do it over the whole process, or you, you should do it over the whole process. Because that's how you learn. That's how you can stray away from reference. Because you know what shapes um, reflect light or where shapes have shadows when the light's coming from a certain direction. That's how you learn. Yeah, that's about it. You can make this learning process far easier for yourself if you take your reference photo. Here it's the toilet paper. And just put it into black and white so suck the saturation out of it because this way it's especially clear where the shadows are and toilet paper without any distracting patterns is pretty good for that after that again you can make your sketch just as usual uh, as usual and proceed to painting these do not have to be perfect quick paintings are enough but you're always learning, you're always putting muscle memory to work and creating new muscle memory. So just do it a few times and then switch to another object and after a few more paintings you can go to more difficult objects and someone in the future you can go to animals or humans, whatever your heart desires really. Oh. The thing with colors, you've seen so far I've only shown you black and white pictures as the right way to do it and that has a point because hue and saturation are both color theory but to be honest I think color theory is a bit distracting when we start painting. I think we should just put them away and only use value at first so define our light and shadows basically a great example for that I'm sure you've seen the, uh, those examples too if people start with painting and only use saturated colors something often seems off and the thing about it is that they don't have their values in check. So values, light and dark colors. And this results in an image that's rather unclear. We can turn this all into black and white and now we can see why it's so hard to read. All of those colors are in a really small range of value. And in the eye you can see a great contrast and that's what we want in images we want high contrast and not an example that I think is quite fitting for this topic I luckily got permission to show you this piece of Savitina Uru I don't exactly know how it's pronounced but uh, yeah I butcher names often okay but here that's exactly what I mean so we have a night piece by Saratina and by Ifaru, an artist I really admire. And both are night scenes, both depict shiny dragons, but you can see the difference. Saratina's piece somehow doesn't seem that clear, at least in comparison to Ifaru's piece. But where is that coming from? Again, we can turn it into black and white, so suck all the saturation out of it. And now we see Saritina's doesn't really have a focus point. I mean, we got some lights here and there sprinkled around. I quickly scrubbed in the focus points. But they are leading nowhere. You straight go to the eye and then you'll just go to the feathers but you, your eye doesn't really stick to anything and that's not a problem but we can do better I think. In Ifaru's piece meanwhile we got 
two really clear focus points. For one, its face. That's pretty clear. It's the lightest point in the picture. It has the highest contrast. And also, its arm. I'd even connect these two focus points because it's all really one thing. But we're sticking to that. There's a smaller focus point in the foreground. At least there's lighter value. But there isn't as much contrast. That is why our eye still strays away back to the face of the dragon. And this is what's missing in Saritina's piece. She has really great anatomy. She has quite the cool composition here. And she even has a story in her picture. We just have to get this last little thing into there. And this is what I'd do. I know from a realism standpoint this doesn't make that much sense because why should there be light behind the dragon? But from an entertainment standpoint or clarity standpoint this absolutely makes sense. We want to look at the face so put some contrast there and through this really light light um, behind the dragon our eye immediately goes to that. And now her great anatomy can shine. Again, here's the new focus point. It's a large focus point with the dragon's face in it. And that's what we want. The last point I want to talk about today is that people always come to me like, oh yeah, I, I want to start painting, but I feel like I have to get better in anatomy first. And to that I say, not necessarily. Because let's have a look at at Luni Luxi's art. I butchered that again. I don't care. I'm sorry though. Um, this is a plane, I believe, and it's a character. And I feel like this piece makes it especially clear. I have a question for you. What anatomy would you give a creature? that's based on a plane? What references would you look up if you wanted to design a creature based on a plane? I have no idea either. So what we have here is we have a character that's built up of simple shapes and that's basically how you build up any character but here it's especially clear because we don't have a real animal to reference it off. Let's take a look at the head. I've gone over the head and just separated the different shapes that she used. She used, for example, the circle on the whole head and some other circuits for the eyes, for the cheeks and all of that. Now we can take all of those different shapes and shade them as single pieces. For example, the overall head shape, as a sphere, is shaded like a sphere. And then the cheek, an elongated sphere, is shaded like an elongated sphere. It's not magic, it's just... We shade shapes like we would shade the shape. And things we draw are made out of these shapes. So it's really not magic. You just have to get how to shade all of those shapes once. That's what we do with those simple objects we want to paint at first. And then we can create unlimited things out of these shapes. That's also how, um, how sculptors work. At least in the digital medium. They take shapes and combine all of those shapes. And that's what we want to do with painting just in our head. Okay, this was all for today. I hope it helped some of you. And I'd love to see some of your practice paintings. Just tag me on Instagram. Um, I'll take a look for those if I have the time to. And I don't know what to say anymore. So, I guess, bye.